At least bow your heads in prayer with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Heavenly Father above, who gives us every good and perfect gift. Amen. At the beginning of the sermon, I really wanted to start out with like a quote from the, the wrestler, The Rock. You know, do you smell what The Rock is cooking? But I don't think most of you would get that, so I'm not going to bypass it. So maybe some other time, because you'll know what The Rock layeth down. But. So instead, I want to ask a quiz question, uh, a question on... According to the Mohs scale of mineral hardness, this mineral, which actually it's a cheater because it's also a mineral slash rock, it's the number 10. It's the hardest. It's the hardest material considered to be rock. What is it? It's a 10. Hardest material known to be a rock. Diamond. Yeah, I was expecting all the ladies in. It's a diamond. Do you hear a diamond? I was, that's what I was expecting to hear. So yeah, a diamond. It's a diamond. Uh, its natural state and its chemical composition, it's, it's, the, it's the strongest you can get. Uh, the diamond is actually four times even harder and stronger than the next closest mineral, which is corundum. Uh, so it, that's how strong a diamond truly is. And diamonds, they are beautiful rocks. They are made by high heat and high pressure onto carbon. It's in order to arrange its atoms in a unique structure called the diamond cubic lattice, and this is what gives a diamond its great strength. And once a diamond forms its hardness and its toughness, it's great. It has great many useful tasks that it can be used for, such as cutting metal uh, to actually being, a great, uh, being used in great uh, electrical semiconductors and insulators. So they have really different tasks. But diamonds are not perfect. Diamonds have impurities. That's why they're actually classified to be a rock. They actually have other minerals within them. They're difficult to mine. Diamonds, for the most part, have to be mined from deep shafts within the earth. In the possession of diamonds, they cause discord and, discord and strife for many years, pretty much since their existence, even the loss of life in some cases. We often forget that diamonds are not perfect because we also get caught up in their shininess, their beauty, their strength that they exhibit. Jesus was trying to teach his disciples in our gospel reading for today an important lesson, though, that's similar to while we shouldn't forget what it takes to get a diamond. Don't forget what you have in your possession. Don't get caught up in all the shininess of this world and what the world has to offer, but remember what you have in your hearts and on your minds. What the disciples had, it was strong, it was beautiful, it was precious, and it was, yes, more valuable than any diamond. What they had was a rock. The rock. No, it wasn't a diamond, and it's not that wrestler named Dwayne Johnson. They had a different kind. They had the rock, who was Jesus Christ. For what the disciples had, as proclaimed by Peter, as their rock, as Jesus, this was their confession of faith. In the Gospel readings for the past couple weeks, we've heard the importance of faith. From the little faith the disciples displayed out on the sea as Jesus walked on the water, to that great faith that we heard of last week from the Canaanite woman who declared Jesus to be the son of David and who knew that just with those morsels from those crumbs that fell from the table, those little bits of grace were enough for her to be fed. So, who Jesus is and what he gives to us is our confession of faith. It's our rock. For faith, faith is not in ourselves. Faith does not come from the things of this world. But faith is found in Christ alone. Christ is the cornerstone of the church. We're just saying that. But faith is that foundation that is built around that cornerstone that is Christ Jesus our Lord. Faith is that foundation that we confess and profess how we are saved by grace, by the gift of Christ our Lord. For this is by grace you have been saved through faith in Christ. This is not your own doing. It is a free gift from God. 
Faith is what we believe. Faith is what we hope for. Faith is looking beyond ourselves to see what we have been given in our possession. In faith, we look back to see how God has provided for His people from of old. Isaiah had to remind the people of that in our Old Testament reading from this morning. Isaiah had to remind the people of the Lord Yahweh's words. He had to remind them. Do you remember who Abraham was? Do you remember what Abraham had before I came along? Do you remember Sarah? Everyone thought she was barren, but the Lord with Sarah, she became the mother of all nations. She became the mother of the people of Israel. Look what happens when God is with us and God gives us this faith. He was with the descendants just as much as He is with us today. Because of faith, we look at ourselves and we see there's more than what we can do. There's what God does for us. Paul reminds us this in our epistle reading for Romans chapter 12 for this morning. For by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Once again, faith is crucial. Faith is important. And it is this God-given faith that we have, that we live in, we believe in, and we trust in this very day. This is what Jesus was drawing the disciples' attention to. To receive the result of faith is not just looking back, not just looking in the here and now, but faith is also looking forward to what is to come. Jesus says in His words from today's Gospel reading about what is to come. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind in earth, you shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is because of faith. Think about it. Whatever you bound on earth and bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. So are you going after the search for material things? Are you going after the search for making sure you have a name that won't be forgotten of in this world? If that's what you're going after, and that's what you get. But then you might have bypassed faith in the life to come. If you're going after and you're willing to lose even your own life for the faith, for Jesus Christ our Lord, then what will you gain once you lose this life in this world? Eternal life in the life to come. All this is because of the faith that we have in that confession and profession that Peter said. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. That was a truly remarkable statement by Peter concerning Jesus Christ, especially concerning where they're at in our Gospel reading for this morning. They were in Caesarea Philippi first verse of our gospel reading lets us know Jesus and his disciples were in the district there of Caesarea Philippi. And that was a place that was pretty far off. It's actually noted that it's uh, the furthest that Jesus and his disciples traveled. It was 25 miles north to the Sea of Galilee. So they are in Gentile country. They are far away from their homeland. And there is where Peter gives this great confession of faith. It's there in Caesarea Philippi. And that in itself is kind of a funny place to be confessing the faith to Jesus. Caesarea Philippi, it was a place, a city that was actually built around commemorating the gods, especially the god Pan. Then it was rebuilt to celebrate Caesar and all his accomplishments. Then there was a twist because Herod's son Philip wanted to recognize his dad, Herod the Great, so he also gave it a little bit of refurbishing, hence the complete name Caesarea Philippi. So there, at this location, the furthest point north that Jesus and his disciples went in his ministry that we read in the Gospel according to Matthew, this Gentile territory, we hear Peter's bold confession of faith. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But before we hear those words, we take a step back again. We take a step back and hear those words which become our own we hear those other words about who others thought Jesus was. See, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? They knew better. Is this a trick question? Jesus always tries to trick us. Is this a trick? What's going on? How do we answer this? How do we respond? Because we know our response isn't going to be right. Well, we'll say that it's others. So the first one, some say you're John the Baptist. 
But that couldn't be, since his own disciples knew that John the Baptist even sent people to Jesus saying, are you really the Christ or should we expect another? Then they say, well, some say that you're, Ezekiel, or you're Elijah, the prophet. But that can't be true. Elijah himself declared his frailty in 1 Kings 19, verse 4, in these words, I am no better than my father's. Then the disciples say, well, others say you're Jeremiah. No, not the bullfrog, but the prophet. Maybe you're one of the other great prophets. But that couldn't be. Because like Jeremiah, all the other prophets too, they always wrestled, why me? Jeremiah in the first chapter starts off, why did the Lord choose me to go and declare this word to his people? But there was one person who didn't question his mission, and that was Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. He was the Christ. He was and is the Son to the Father. There was no questioning why Jesus came and what he, was do, what he would do in order to save the entire human race. Cities, they would rise and fall, just as Caesarea Philippi did. Nations and kingdoms, they will totter and change. But Christ, Christ will remain the same, just as you sung moments ago. Christ will remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the one who saves. He is, as Peter declared, He is the living God. He is not far off, but He is with us. He will be with us wherever we go. He is not dead or He is not made of wood or metal or some other uh, material here on earth. He is the living God in the flesh. Yet, there is a part of our Gospel reading that seems kind of contradictory. The very last verse. Here you have Peter giving a great confession of faith of you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus is saying, great, that is exactly on task. Those are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But then, do you hear what he says at the end? Be quiet. Silence. Do not tell anyone that I am the Christ. That seems kind of odd. Unless we see what people wanted out of Jesus at that time and what people want out of Jesus even in the here and the now. The people then were expecting this Messiah to come to be a political savior to the country. This political savior to save Israel. They were expecting their hero, their Messiah, to come in, swooping in, riding on a great steed to save the day like some storybook ending. He would never expected just another man in the crowd to die for their sins. This is why Jesus tells his disciples to be quiet for now. They had the confession, they had the faith, and they knew when the right time would be to say it, to declare it unto all the nations. They knew in their eyes and in their minds that the kingdom of heaven would come, and they knew just at the right time when to confess that. The disciples' silence would speak volumes because once, complete, once Christ had completed that redemptive work that he was sent to do via the cross and the tomb, they then had just the right moment to declare that good news of faith. That faith is found in Christ and in him alone. Faith comes to us through Christ, and it's that faith that gives us the keys to the kingdom. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is saying to Peter, and he says to us, you are being given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's like giving a 16-year-old keys to a brand new Mustang or Camaro or Corvette and saying, knock yourself out. Have fun. It's unheard of. But that's what Jesus tells Peter. You have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You also have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And this comes through faith. Faith in Christ, that he has accomplished that redemptive work for you. He has died for all of your sins. He has risen from the dead to give you life everlasting. And this is the confession of faith that we have to go out and to share without this in this world. Because the church isn't about being here in this building. The church is about going to declare the word of the Lord to all the nations. To declare that Christ has come to us to save us. 
to redeem us and to give us life everlasting. This confession of faith that Peter gave, it would remain, and it does remain this very day. For Jesus was and will ever be the Christ, the Son of the living God. Diamonds are forever? Not necessarily. They can be crushed up and destroyed. But this proclamation, this declaration of faith, it will remain forever. For they, the diamonds, they will come and go. But this rock-solid confession of faith, it will remain for an eternity. It's that confession of faith, that keys that Peter was given, that we continue to look to and for today. It's why we have what we do on our altar. On the altar, the center person is who? Sunday school answer. Jesus. We always look to Jesus at the center. And then the guy closer to my side looks like a sword. And you'd be like, man, we're a very violent church. We have a guy with a sword. We have a sword over here. We have another guy with a sword there. But that guy with the sword is who? St. Paul. St. Paul's Lutheran. That's where we get our name. But then we have the other guy over on the lectern side there who's looking to Jesus and he's holding something very dear as he's looking. What is he doing? He's got the keys. Because who is that? It's Peter. It's Peter always reminding us the keys to the kingdom is Jesus Christ and him alone. Peter is focusing us back to Christ to remind us that yes, we have the word of God. Yes, we have grace given to us. We have the very kingdom of God in our grasp. You have the kingdom of God with you this day and you will have the kingdom of God with you forever. For the kingdom of heaven has been won for you through Christ our Lord, through those nail-scarred hands, through that resurrected, triumphant, glorious, risen Lord, the living God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is what we have, and that is our confession of faith in this life and as we eagerly look forward to the life to come. We have the keys to the kingdom. We have the foundation of faith, and nothing can shake it or take it away because that foundation is built on Christ and Him alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now that peace that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as the rock and as the foundation of our faith, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>